Hi, everyone, and welcome to the Zephyr Developer Summit. My name is Yuval Press. I'm going to talk to you a little bit about uh, high bandwidth sensors within Zephyr. I have some contact information down there. If you need anything, please feel free to reach out. So we're going to talk a little bit about what are high bandwidth sensors, first of all, and kind of why should anyone even care about this. Um, we'll then discuss the evolution of sensors in Zephyr moving from a uh, blocking API to this asynchronous one and kind of what does this enable us to do. And then finally, the new features, uh, which are the streaming sensor APIs that are going to be coming soon. So high bandwidth sensors can be defined in a lot of different ways to a lot of different people, right? We could look at them as how many samples per second they produce, how many bytes of data per second they produce. But really what we care about is just it's any sensor whose data processing and pipeline is a bottleneck to our application, right? Um, so the existing APIs effectively are these blocking calls. We first make a fetch a call from the application to the driver. The driver then performs the bus IO in order to read the data that was requested. And during this time, we're actually writing data to a buffer that's owned by the driver. And the application is thread is blocked on uh, this, this fetch. Once the fetch is complete, uh, we can read all the data from the driver's cached uh, buffer in order to process it and do whatever the application actually needs with it. And there are a couple of problems with this. The first is obviously that the application is blocked during this whole time. Uh, the data processing assumes that the driver is locked. And what this means is uh, once we've started processing data in that loop at the bottom of the application thread there, we read maybe the first um, sample or the first channel uh, X, and then we could get an interrupt or something could happen and we switch our thread context at which point maybe another thread is performing another fetch on the same driver. When we come back, the value of Y could be from a completely different sample. We don't have any guarantee that at, when we read multiple channels, they are all from the exact same sample. Um, this is really a side effect of having the memory owned by the driver. So looking at what this changes to when we go to an asynchronous flow, we get these non-blocking uh, calls during the bus IO thanks to the um, RTIO subsystem. Data processing does not require anything really from the driver's uh, cache. This is done because the application now owns the memory. And having that application own memory gives us a lot of flexibility that is generated by uh, what we're going to use in this talk as a mempool. And we'll dive into that. One of the other interesting bits about this graph or this chart is notice that the decoder is actually never blocked. And the decoder is 100% stateless. It is associated uh, with the sensor type, meaning the uh, compatible string. Um, and it can technically be instantiated without a sensor being connected. We'll dive into that a little bit later. Um, so how do we enable this? First, we need to enable sensors, and then we're going to enable the kind of experimental sensor async API. So there are two modes of reading, and we're, that's where we'll split this talk into. We have this one-shot data, which is effectively an asynchronous version of the existing APIs. The alternative is the streaming data, which we'll talk, touch on the second half of this uh, talk. So the first thing we need to do for this one-shot sample is set up a reader. And we're using the um, RTIO IO dev in order to do that. If you're not familiar with RTIO, the RTIO subsystem, please uh, read about it a little bit on the um, Zephyr documentation page. It is definitely worth your while. Uh, it, it's it's definitely it's improved our performance quite a bit when processing these um, these sensor samples. So. This uh, macro allows us to uh, create, statically create this reader using device tree. And you can see here, we're giving it a name. Under my reader, um, we use the DT chosen for the lid accelerometer um, in this case, in this example. And then we're only trying to read the channel XYZ, but you're, you can provide any number of channels to the IO dev uh, here, just add a comma and add the next channel and so on and so forth. For the processing context, we're using RTIO with mempool. 
Um, we'll dive into that in a little bit, but overall the mempool gives us a lot of flexibility. Um, the name is given as the first parameter, and then we have two parameters for the submission queue and the completion queue, followed by the mempool configuration, which is the number of blocks, the block size, and the alignment, which is used for uh, DMA uh, access if we need to. So, yeah, what, what, what is the mempool buying us? What, what are we actually getting from this? And one of the biggest things is now that the application owns the memory, um, we can delay the processing. Now, the mempool is not necessary, right? You could use an RTIO context and for every read, provide your own buffer. Um, the mempool just makes it a little bit easier and allows the um, allocation of memory to be delayed until the sensor is actually ready to do the fetch. So we can also control a little bit about how the memory is managed, right? So a small block could be used for one shot reading. So if we configure the mempool to have really small blocks, that would make sense if our sensors are all, always doing one shot. So one frame or one time uh, slats, bleh, one time snap shot uh, per reading. But if we're using a hardware FIFO or we're looking to do kind of batching processing, maybe larger blocks make a lot of sense. And if we want to do a mixed uh, set of one shot and streaming data, maybe we want to just have a lot of small blocks uh, for this mixed use. So how do we queue the read? Well, there's a very simple uh, sensor API function that was added, uh, sensor read. You need to pass it a pointer to your reader, a pass it a pointer to your RTIO context, and then finally the any optional user data. This could be null. In this case, we provided um, the device pointer, which is the sensor member uh, of the reader. Processing the data is done uh, shortly after we provided a. Uh, uh, sensor processing helper. You can look at the implementation details on the source if you want to do custom processing, but this should provide most of what you need. Um, it is a blocking call and will trigger my callback when there's data available, and it will automatically free the memory once processing is done. Now, in this case, we put it in the same thread as sensor read in order to kind of mimic the original blocking APIs, but in reality, this doesn't have to be, right? You could have a processing thread where all it is is a while loop that just calls sensor uh, processing with callback over and over again. So the implementation details is really we block and wait for the RTIO CQE, which is the completion queue event. Once we get it, we copy out the information that we're gonna need from the CQE so we can release it right after. And releasing it just allows the RTIO subsystem to continue processing new events. Um, once we've released it, we can call the callback because we have a copy of all the data we need. And when the callback returns, we're gonna release the um, read buffer back to the mempool. And a couple of improvements we're planning to add. Uh, we wanna add more helpers to complement this uh, processing with callback. So for example, uh, one could imagine a sensor processing blocking and this would effectively allow you to pro do the processing in line. The only thing you would lose there is the fact that you would have to release the memory yourself once it's done, uh, once you're done processing with it. Uh, the next thing is we're looking to provide a couple of common API tests to verify that all the decoders that are being added follow the guidelines for decoding, um, meaning that uh, the shift operation, we'll get into that, it, the shift value is the same for all axes of the of this of a similar measurement type. Uh, there are a couple of other guidelines for writing your own decoder, but you know, kind of th this might sound a little complicated. And you might be asking why do we even need the decoder? Well, when you get the data right now, it's stored in this RTIO mempool, and it's generally speaking stored in a raw byte format, whatever the sensor provided. Um, this allows us to kind of batch process all these samples on our own terms, effectively maybe delayed thread. Um, maybe we want to uh, have the user even trigger uh, when we want to process this. And 
The final thing is it means that we can actually also get the decoder statically because it has no state. It's not, it's associated with the compatible string and not with the actual instance of the device. Um, we can get it uh, that way and this overall means that the processing doesn't even need to happen on the same core. So here's a kind of simplif simplified view of where what could happen. We get a bit, bit of new data and we have three options of what to do with it. We can save it maybe to some persistent storage um, as is raw buffer. We can send the raw data over, over wire um, or we can process it in a separate thread or the same thread on the same core. Now in the first two options, when the other end, maybe it's a different core, maybe it's a different board entirely, um, is ready to process, it's going to read the data and it's going to get an instance of the same decoder. So as long as the two um, cores are running the same version of Zephyr, these are guaranteed to be compatible. Um, and addition, in addition to being able to get it statically, we can also get the decoder at runtime if if you need to, right? In this case, we passed, uh, we have one handler for the callback that uh, uses the user data, which is a device pointer. And you can see here, sensor get decoder will get a pointer to the decoder. The cost of this is basically a system call if you have user threads enabled. Once you've got the decoder though, you can start processing the data from the buffer. Uh, so here we have an example of getting the timestamp uh, and the timestamps are in nanosecond units. Although if your core doesn't provide nanosecond accuracy, right, obviously you'll have big steps in there. So the rest of the data that's actually in there, the channels is um, maybe a little hard to visualize at first, but we're gonna take a couple of steps through this. So in this example, we have an accelerometer running at 200 Hertz and a gyro and sampling the dye temperature every 50 Hertz. And what you can see is that um, effectively the accelerometer gets four samples for every one gyro and dye temperature. So one frame here is a single snapshot in time. So going back, you can think of each row as a single frame. Um, they were collected together. They are assumed to have happened exactly at the same time. Obviously some details can be uh, there. There's, there's some wiggle to that. Um, the samples here, we can imagine if we have a sensor sampling at 100 Hertz and we're gonna collect over 20 milliseconds, we'll have two frames. Now, it is important to note that for one-shot reads, only one frame will ever be present uh, when we're decoding. So two of the key arguments here for the decoder is this frame iterator and channel iterator. And both should be initialized to zero before decoding starts. I highly recommend using the curly bracket zero for this because while right now you could just set it equal to zero because they map to an, uh, an int, they, th there's no guarantee that that will stay the case, right? They could, we might end up changing this. This is an experimental API. And if we ever change it to a struct, this will be forward compatible with that. The return values for the decoder are uh, relatively simple. It's uh, negative values for errors, zero if we're done decoding the frame or the buffer, the entire buffer. And if it's greater than zero, then it's the number of channels that were decoded. So you can kind of see here, this is how we can tell when a frame ended. In this case, we have the frame iterator and the frame iterator previous allocated both to zero. We pass the frame iterator and we compare it here. If the frame iterator changed, notice that we're not doing a less than or a greater than, it's just if it's different, then we know a new frame started and then we update the previous uh, value. Now, all the data that's being decoded comes out as Q31 types. And if you're not familiar with it, there's also some documentation on the ZDSP. DSP stands for Digital Signal Processing uh, Library, or I should say subsystem. And the goal of that subsystem is to provide a, a common front end that you can use and allow each architecture to provide um, optimized implementations of the DSP library. So, Overall, this is a fixed point fractional value on a range of minus one to one. So you can imagine a Q31, basically int 32 max is representative of one and an int 32 min is a minus one. Uh, 
And then along with this Q31 data, you have a shift value. So a shift of zero doesn't do basically anything. And a shift of one will double your range. Uh, it is a, a left shift. And then a shift of negative one, meaning, meaning a right shift, basically will reduce the range and kind of uh, effectively increase the um, step, uh, sorry, decrease the step function of which the um, accuracy goes by. The uh, shift value is provided by the decoder get shift. And the guarantee that the decoder contract is that the samples, um, all the samples are in the same, uh, in the samples are in the same buffer will always have the same uh, shift. That means that if you have multiple um, instances, multiple frames of accelerometer X, the, the next frame is also going to have the same shift value. You can't have different shift values for different frames. And additionally, accelerometer X and Excel Y will always have the same shift value. Um, this really, this guarantee kind of makes the, using the DSP library a lot more handy since you don't have to realign all your data back uh, to, to, so that you can do the arithmetic with it. So here's a calculation sample. Uh, we're not going to really dive into it, but what it does is it assumes we're getting uh, an accelerometer XYZ and we're going to just calculate the magnitude of the vector. Um, so, you know, we're going to take the square of each one of these using the ZDSP multiply Q31. Um, we're going to do a saturating sum on uh, X, Y, and Z. Um, and then we're going to take the square root of that value. Uh, keep in mind the uh, square root is not yet ported, but it is scheduled for the next quarter, basically Q3 of 2023. Uh, so we'll have that soon in the DSP library. Um, diving into the streaming data next, um, this is a brand new feature that we're going to be adding also in uh, 3.5 for Zephyr. And, you know, we can think of streaming, there's, I guess, a, a bunch of different things that could happen with streaming. One is events, right? So a step event, significant motion, tap events, uh, things that may, be, may or may not be correlated to specific data, uh, right? A tap event just happened. There's no data associated with it necessarily. Um, others might include data such as the FIFO watermark. Well, the hardware FIFO might include data and we might want to know both that it happened and what the data is uh, that's associated with it. So setting up the stream reader is very similar to setting up the one-shot reader. We need to give it a name. Um, we're gonna give it uh, the kind of the device tree node that we want to use. And then instead of the channels, we're going to use the sensor stream prep. And this is going to take the trigger type. And we'll go that into there. And it's basically the sensor trigger type. And the second one is the guidelines of what to do with the data once you, um, once you got the trigger. And the options are to include the data, meaning uh, put, put it into the kind of uh, memory pool or the memory buffer that was associated with the request. We can drop the data. So in the case of a FIFO watermark, we might actually want to flush the entire data and get rid of it, meaning only the event will be reported to the client. And uh, no op, meaning just tell me that the trigger happened and uh, don't do anything with the data, leave it on the device. Maybe we want to do something um, on our own with that. And starting the stream is as simple as calling sensor stream, just like sensor read. Um, the only difference is we have an optional handle pointer that we can pass in. And that handle pointer is used to canceling or stopping the stream um, right there. So, We've already talked about decoders and now we've added these uh, triggers and the trigger is part of the header, uh, meaning there are no frames of triggers. Uh, we, they're associated with effectively the, the, they're always associated with the first frame that is gonna be coming to you. And in this case, what we're doing is we're gonna batch process uh, up to five triggers at a time. We know how many triggers were done, uh, were fired, and then we're gonna print them out and as long as the number of triggers is, um, if it's negative, we're going to step out. And if the number of triggers is, um, sorry, if it's negative or zero, we're going to step out. Uh, 
and if the number of triggers is less than five uh, being read, we're going to try reading again. Um, so, oh, sorry, I stepped backwards. The overall summary of what we're where we're going with sensors here is we're using RTIO and specifically mempools for some control over granularity on this. Uh, we're removing the intra processing away from the sensors, right? So previously when the sensor got the interrupt, it owned the thread or passed everything to the um, system work queue. And owning the thread wastes a lot of memory in ROM uh, in RAM, sorry, and then uh, re using the system work queue gives us a very uncontrolled environment for timing. Um, One-shot streaming uh, data paths are effectively the same, uh, sorry, so one-shot and streaming data paths are effectively the same now. So you don't have to worry about understanding how data is going to get to you. You effectively you give it the, the callback, right? You have the processing thread, you give it the callback, and magically, when, regardless of whether it was a one-shot event or a streaming event, they all bubble up into the same processing uh, function or the same uh, completion queue event. And this means that we have also finer control over what do we do with the trigger when it's detected, right? The current APIs don't allow us to pass that information yet. Um, when the trigger happens, it's kind of up to the driver implementation to decide what to do. And if you have any questions, please reach out. Uh, my contact info was on the first slide, and I'll be happy to answer and address anything that you might have. Thanks. Take care.